what have we got in store for our listeners tonight, Alexander? Well, the first part of the program, Christopher, we've got an interview with an artist, mm. an up-and-coming Sydney artist by the name of John Douglas, who's got an exhibition. Up-and-coming? I mean, he's had lots of exhibitions. But not so many in Sydney. If I, when I had mm. a look at his resume, there were many in Queensland. Right. They have art in Queensland. Mm, not anymore. He's come here. That's right. <laughs> Oh, we love Queensland, particularly when we leave it. Mm, and we both did. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this um, artist is having an exhibition next week in Sydney, the details of which will be told later to our listeners. They'll be waiting with bated breath to hear that. Oh, it's a very exciting exhibition. And the the artworks are concerning... Oh, what do you think, Christopher? You've seen them as well. I think they're concerning the nexus between spirituality, drag culture, personal liberation, and... Don't forget leather. Leather. Mm. Visitation by angelic beings. Um, Frida Kahlo. Mm. And... Uh, Fourth dimensional conscious reality, perhaps. Yes, definitely. I, that was the thought. The moment I saw those works, I thought the fourth dimension. Well... The paintings are accompanied with a text mm. written by Victor Barker, who is an author. He's presently uh, awaiting publication of his second work. I think it's coming out uh, next week. And it's a very interesting book, The Truth of Everything. I already know that, but other people should read it, I That's think. right. Yeah. And what we're going to hear first are some comments made during the week by both John the artist and Victor the author, concerning these works and how they felt about them, how they were generated, the mediums that John chose to use. And also you'll be hearing a poem that Victor will be reciting that he wrote to accompany these works. Now, how he came about these, the language of the poem, I'll leave the tape to tell our listeners. And Let's have a listen, Christopher. I'm so excited. Here we go commented that the paintings do look very new age in appearance, I guess probably because of the use of purples and blues extensively throughout the paintings. However, they're not taken from anything um, really based on the new age ideas. They're based on colouring and composition from 12th and 13th century Christian illustrations. So it's interesting to see the principle of everything old is new again in practice, I guess. People that I had to work with weren't always able to be around when I wanted to use them. Plus also I like to work from photographs as much as possible recently because I like the spontaneity you can get with the photograph and then pushing that further forward into painting. The paintings are comprised of many different elements to make up the image. They are gouache on paper but they're worked on from photographs. They're also worked into photocopies. The idea behind using so many different technical elements was to just experiment with, give the opportunity to experiment with different styles, I guess. And as you can see, looking at them now, they're drag queens and leather men. They're in vaguely medieval settings and also make reference to some famous old works of art as well. But there's obviously very modern references with drag queens and leather obviously being the easier ones to pick. The idea behind using so many different elements is that I believe that through everything there is one common denominator. So in using from many different sources, it's perhaps one way of finding the thing that's common to them all. And I guess some philosophies would say that's finding the one in everything. In night, there'll be performances from many different people, and many different types of performances. There's drag shows, there's strip shows, there's live singing, and perhaps even an opera singer and so on. And again, that will be interesting to have because although it's something completely out of context, in appearance, I do feel that there's, again, there's some sort of common denominator. It's almost as if it brings the paintings to life in a way so that they're moving around with the people right there physically. The last three paintings in the exhibition I've called the three jewels. And it's made up of bits of various prayer connected with Tibetan uh, practices of dealing with people who are between death and life. We live in the gaps between 
there are no absolutes. No time that is universally day, no time that is universally night. And from the moment of birth we are dying, we live in the gaps between. What man, what woman, what nation, what world, what you, what I, where? We live in the gaps between where, who, what, you, I. We better describe to our millions of listeners out there listening to Radio Nuda, taking their clothes off while they listen to us so they can be like us naked, mm. what these paintings look like. What did you think they looked like, Alexander? What do they remind you of, the colours, the forms? Well, the first impression I got was from looking at the little the leaflet that the artist John was giving out. And that, of course, was of a drag queen being supported by two muscle-bound men as he or she was coming out of the water in a shell a la Venus. A Botticelli. Like the old Botticelli, exactly, with these two lovely little mm. angelic figures on the top. So, of course, the first thing that hits the eye is the, the past references. Yeah. Because uh, when I first saw it, it wasn't colour, it was black and white. Yeah. So I didn't really see the, the wonderful colours that were there. And it was that past reference that it's that um, slightly comical look at the past while yet remaining very, very modern. Trey postmodern. Oh, very postmodern. Very postmodern. Foucault in postmodern in a way, Christopher, perhaps. Mm. Mm. History of sexual. <laughs> yes. Well, what did you think? Well, I mean, obviously the colours remind me of the colours in the weight tarot deck. You know, um, which is interesting, I suppose, because they in turn, as John was saying, there were colours from the 11th, 12th century. They also reminded me a lot of the work of Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist and personage, uh, in the sense that there's a sort of, she sort of using the sort of medieval quality, quality but with a co the colours are quite ferocious and um, speak of modern passion and... And suffering and suffering. But I mean, that's what you describe. That's describing the subject matter, not what they look like. I mean, they look like tarot cards. Yeah, well, they. They, they look like tarot cards, but mm. sort of stylized figures. It, the figures, the faces aren't precise. They're, they're somewhat almost primitivist, childlike, you know, uh, primitive, the, the way you'd imagine a very gifted 10 year old child, but which, mm. is, which is a valid sign. It gives a simplicity, a universality. The figures have a universal quality because it, they have such simple lines to them. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I mean, I thought the same thing, but from a different perspective. I saw because it was they were so structured and so organised in a way, the paintings to me, that, that view of a, a naive almost. Well, naive a, is a good adjective. A, we love a the A very um, intellectualised, emotionalised naivety, if you like. I mean, it's uh, a true naivety from a 10-year-old child is not the same as then as the course. naivety from of an adult. Of course. Uh, here, the naivety... And here, it's much more structured. Well, when you say structure, I'd say naivety by an adult is a pretense. It's, it, we are trying to assume naivety. We, we, it's a mask that is donned deliberately. So it's deliberate naivety, almost a contradiction in terms, whereas naivety of a child is, is actually true naivety. Well, maybe, yes, no. Some of us are actually genuinely vague all the time, Christopher. Ah, uh, maybe. You've just been mentioning, Alexander, that these paintings seem to come to some sort of culmination with the last three paintings, which is one each of each of the Klitz sisters with a halo around the head and seems to be achieving some sort of divinity. The order that I painted these paintings in is not the order they're in now. When I painted these, they weren't actually the last paintings. So I'd like to ask you, Victor, having put these in these order, if you felt that these were the final three and that they summed up the rest of the paintings. Oh, yes, yes, they did. It, it seemed very clear to me that this was a conclusion, these three side by side, and the text that goes with them I used from the Tibetan Book of the Debt goes like this, it says, this is after the end, this is before the beginning, pray for deliverance from the dangerous pathway, pray for protection from fear, pray for rescue, pray to the three jewels. And I see these three paintings as being the three jewels. I use Christian imagery because, for a start, it's my own background as a child. And I think no matter whether you're painting or whether you're just running around breathing, there's a lot of your life is based on your childhood and shapes the way you're seeing and acting and reacting through the world. So it was a bit more relevant to me and a bit more personal 
for me emotionally, I guess, than using something else that I may know more of intellectually. So I chose Christian imagery. I used a lot of old Christian imagery from, as I said, 12th, 13th century paintings, but I wanted to put it into a context relevant to now and relevant to me. So I've used myself in drag as a central character. That puts me right into the context right for a start. It also, I think, makes it a bit more relevant to anyone looking at the stuff too. And this is not to say that I either condone or reject Christian ideas. It's just that they're there. I think at first my thoughts in doing these paintings was that putting drags in Christian settings and having them with stigmata and jumping off crucifixes was actually making fun of the whole thing. But my thoughts having lived with the paintings a bit is that it's putting them into a more appropriate context and doesn't really make fun of it so much at all really. I think to look at it very quickly it can appear that they're making fun of the Christian religion and I'm not actually a Christian. I don't think very much of dogmatic religion as such, be it Christian or otherwise, but these particular paintings are not making fun of Christianity, I don't think. I think it just places it, if anything, in a more relevant context to people who are perhaps into dragon leather and, and other things, but maybe just people who like to think a bit more outside the confines of what we're taught. I guess, in a way, I see these paintings as being my own pictorial version of, say, the Gnostic Gospels. I think I'd like people to think full stop. I don't know that I want them to think in a particular way. I guess that's why we've used lots of different elements in the imagery, in the sounds and other visuals and performance on the night. So just to kick people off thinking and hopefully a bit lightheartedly too. I mean, it doesn't, just because you question and think doesn't mean you can't have fun along the way. Any reaction is better than passing by something and not reacting at all. If you are the person who is trying to communicate something, initially, at least that means it's noticed. Hopefully someone's going to dig a bit deeper. But being noticed in the world that we live in with all the distractions and noise and sights, everything that's here, it's very important to try to be noticed full stop. I was trying to find what emotions stirred in me in looking at John's paintings and then find a way of saying something similar in words. And at first I was going to go for medieval Christian words, the kind of stuff you find in books of hours and so on. But I felt that was going to close things up. And John is obviously opening up here the idea of purgatory. This is not most people's idea of purgatory, I don't think, these, these, uh, these pictures, although there is the Christian element there and, and, and so on. So I didn't want to close it up by using a text based on Christianity. And that's where the, the Buddhist... Uh, text seem to me to continue to open it up so I would hope that people seeing these and reading this would be opened a little more than when they uh, arrived at the exhibition. The Christian symbolism in the paintings is very evident. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, what did it mean to you? What did that sort of Christian symbolism, what does it evoke in you, Alexander? Well, the fact that it has so much to do with past and not current things, of course, evokes in me a feeling of past or of a connection with being that little Roman Catholic boy and, and that whole Roman Catholic upbringing. And then the juxtaposition on that of the drag, I'm thinking now, Christopher, that particular painting with those the three clit sisters, who incidentally are the main characters in almost all of the paintings in this collection called Cassie Clit in Purgatory. Mm. Uh, the, the one where the three sisters, the, sorry, the three clit sisters are standing in front of the three crosses which are burning. Yeah. And they've got their arms up and, I may add, their armpits shaved. Waxed. Oh, I noticed. <laughs> I'm very impressed, John. I'm glad you didn't put any of that awful hair in there. Anyway, they had them up. They looked like they were about ready to sing a Diana Ross number. Mm. You know, that, the juxtaposition of the irreverence and yet at the same time something deeper going on underneath was slightly disturbing, not in an uncomfortable sense, but in a thinking sense. I think for me what I find is that obviously we came from a youth in which we were taught or given almost this mandatory instruction, this is what the nature of spirituality, religion God, the divine, is. And it's not just gay people. A lot of people will go through the thing and thinking, well, because it's been imposed on me, I reject this, you know, because 
It goes hand in hand with a society which doesn't evidence much compassion, but rather a lot of hypocrisy. A lot of the values which are supposed to be Christian values or in other societies Buddhist values or like mm. um, in practice are never exercised. You know, these things don't happen. And so we go through a thing where we reject, well, this is just all fairy tales, hypocritical ones, which tend to be used by moralising people who pass judgment on us without really understanding us, and that is whether we're gay or straight. So are you saying that you thought the paintings gave, uh, for you, a sense of reaction against this, no, the use of Christian symbolism? No, no, no. I'd rather say, they were not quite that. I think what they were was the next stage, is what happens is you reach a point whereby you've rejected all those things and the drag element, you know, in our modern society is the epitome of a hedonistic, reactionary mm. expression, which yes. is opposed to that sort of childhood training. But by bringing back the religious symbols, the fact is that these symbols are still powerful and they still represent needs and desires that we have for a feeling of spiritual fulfilment, of connectedness. You know, these are Jungian issues. They're not issues, not just gay people, all people. You go through this materialist phase and at the end of the materialism you think, well, what else is there? And you can't help, even people who haven't even reached that point, when you see these pieces of art, you think, of course you're disturbed mm. because it reminds you, well, I've gone, I, yes, I rejected all that, but there is still something going on. There are issues you know, I what I was really rejecting was a moralising society of hypocrites, etc. But I still have a personal need, we all have a personal need for some sort of greater understanding. And even if we are atheists, we still need to have a sense of place. I'm not saying that people have to look at these things and think, I, oh, yes, I actually secretly believe in God and I need to reconcile myself with some religious experience. But you need to reconcile yourself with some greater experience, I think, at some point. Wow, Christopher, what an answer. However, <laughs> we might need to go on to another song here because there's quite a bit I could discuss with that, the idea of a Jungian experience in here. Oh, we'll have and another song. And you know song. my feelings about Jung. We love him. I love We him. love Jung. Alexander, what do you mean by Jungian? By Jungian, I mean the concept that Jung had of exploring self through dreams and by dreams to come from the inner into the outer. Jung, of course, was involved heavily in dreams and in archetypes, collective consciousness. In relation to John's painting, or the paintings, the set of 28 that compromise Cassie Clit in Purgatory, they're Jungian to me in a sense in that they're, they're ethereal and at the same time they're physical. They're they're humanistic and they're ethereal, so they're like an in-between. They're that state of dreaming where you're just about ready to wake up and something from the conscious comes to the fore. Now, in a true Jungian sense, you could never say the unconscious because in a Jungian sense, the unconscious is always unconscious by definition of being unconscious, but let's not get sidetracked into that. And that heavy Christian symbolism there is part of the collective consciousness, as we were talking while that song was going on, Christopher. Mm. It relates to all of us, and the fact that it is a collective consciousness is why it touches us, because we all share that experience. So what you're really... Let me be so rude to try to summarise what you've said. You've said... Oh, so please pray see me. I'll pray see you. Exactly. Alexander, exactly. What is being said here is that when you look at the paintings, they have a dreamy quality, which is Jungian, and says they're dreamy. Right. But also, there are symbols that we are seeing, specific symbols. It's not just a general oh, no, dreaminess. General. There are specific symbols there which have conscious and subconscious triggers within them. They are both personal triggers and also triggers because they, they're personal, but because the person is part of the collective unconsciousness, the religious experience is a shared experience, a shared requirement when we see these symbols, we get a feeling which is a common feeling to many people of, of religious experience. Correct. And, and don't forget that John the artist and also Victor in the text is directing these symbols for their own personal end, for what they see as their personal vision in this um, work. We're being manipulated by these people. We're always manipulated in art if the artist knows what they're doing. I love being manipulated when I'm naked. But I don't think the artist necessarily knows or really cares about the reaction. Christopher, we're always naked. Underneath my clothes, I'm always naked. I will repeat that 500 times. I will. I will. 
Hello, my name's Cathy Quit and I have an exhibition. I'm the star of the exhibition, I'd just like to let you know, which is a very important fact that you should be aware of. However, apart from me, there are a number of other people starring in the paintings in their own little way in small but pivotal roles. Clammy Quit and Katie Quit. There's also a few sort of muscle boys who happen to help out with posing for the paintings. We have a lovely woman called Andrea who's made herself look like a drag queen for the painting. Clit sisters were born in 1964. At birth, they were Siamese triplets and they were all joined at the clit. They were separated at birth though, so they did grow up as three individual young girls. They were born at Bernard's Backyard Abortion Clinic. Their motto, you make them, we scrape them. <laughs> Their mother died shortly after birth, rumoured to be due to shock. Although the clit sisters were separated at birth, they do remain emotionally as one. I can just mention that Cassie Clit in Purgatory is on at Inner Circle Gallery. That's on Tuesday the 20th of July, the big opening night, with lots of fabulous stars and guests performing on the night. And of course everyone's welcome to come along and buy and drink and view and most importantly enjoy themselves. And the exhibition runs until August the 2nd. It's at Inner Circle Gallery, 253 Oxford Street, Darlinghurst. On the opening night, some of the people who will be performing are Hugh Munro and Sigourney, who are both hosting the evening. There will also be appearances by Polly, Genitalia, uh, Matthew, the stripper, who's a little bit of a hot number, and many other people, some of whom we can't mention yet because they're going to be a surprise. There are an assortment of people. We wouldn't want anyone to think that it's just all drag queens and leather. There is a supporting cast of literally thousands over the past two or three years, I've become a novelist. I've always been a poet. And I've had a great variety of jobs, and I've lived in different parts of the world. I've studied esoteric religions a lot. I've been up in the Himalayas. I've been in Africa and all over the place. And I'm most concerned that when artists of different media get together, a painter, a writer, a musician, that they do their own thing side by side about a subject, rather than try to uh, interpret each other. I don't like the idea of words describing a picture or uh, paintings describing a poem. It seems to me pointless. But if they are describing the same feelings, the same ideas, then uh, hopefully the sum of them is more than the uh, individual parts. I'll put in a commercial here. I have my second novel is coming out next month and it's called The Truth of Everything. Talking about art, Christopher, I went to see a great art movie last night, a movie for all the family. Yeah, and it reminded us a lot of those paintings, didn't it? In a certain sense. No, no, the paintings well, the blood, were infinitely was better. Blood. Yeah, well. Infinitely better. What was the film, Alexander? Salo. Goodbye from Sydney's favourite radio program. And thanks to, to John and Victor for their views and their interesting comments about the upcoming artwork, Cassie Clit and Purgatory. Where was that again at that old steam bath, isn't it, Christopher? 253. <laughs> no, listen, we, we've run a bit out of control. And next mm. week, next week, we promise a, a program of virtue. So it's goodbye from Radio Nula. Mm. Bye. Bye.